morning. Here we are again in your living room. If you don't know who I am, my name is Noel and I'm the youth director here and also one of the elders. And today it's my pleasure to bring God's word to you out of First Thessalonians. And hopefully you will be encouraged by the words of Paul in this passage. Let me pray for us as we look into God's word together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we long to be together uh, as a church uh, under one roof, Lord, but uh, we pray now that you would use uh, this technology and uh, our living rooms uh, to, uh, to bring in glory and to convict our hearts by your word. Lord, I pray that you would uh, mold us and shape us to look more and more like Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians over the next couple weeks, uh, our theme verse comes out of 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. I'm going to read that for us. And it says, May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and, the, and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace given us eternal encouragement and good hope, encouraging your hearts and strengthening you, in every good deed and word. So we see here from this passage that, uh, that, that the theme is encouragement and hope and strength. And, uh, and I think we'll see that pretty clearly today uh, from Paul in chapter 2 of First Thessalonians. I'm going to have trouble saying that today. And, uh, but hopefully we see this encouragement and hope. And, and this section from Paul, uh, as he's writing to the church, uh, he's encouraging them uh, to follow uh, his example as a disciple maker. Uh, he's reminding them, this is what I did when I came to you. And my hope is today that we would follow uh, his encouragement. Uh, we would follow his example uh, and be disciple makers as Paul did. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, maybe take a second, pause the video and go grab one. If you If you don't have one in front of you or pull your device out and be able to follow along with me. We're going to look at First Thess Thessalonians. Holy smokes, that's going to kill me. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. I'm going to read that now for us. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our Lord, we dare to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests the heart. You know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on masks to cover up greed? God is our witness. We were not looking for the praise of men, nor, nor from you, nor anyone else. As apostles, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you. We, like a mother caring for her little children, we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you, who believed. For you know that we delight with e which with each of you as are dealt with each of you as children as, as as a father deals with his children, encouraging you, comforting you, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continuously because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the words of men, but as it actually is, the words of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers, 
become became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Jesus Christ. You suffered from your from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In the same way, always uh, in the same way they always heap up their sins to the limit and the wrath of God has come upon them at last. As we uh, as we look at 1 Thessalonians, it's uh, it's important for us to uh, to remember what's going on here. Paul uh, and Silas and Timothy uh, have gone to Thessalonica, and uh, they are they're there to start the church and to preach God's word, uh, and to ultimately uh, form a church and make disciples of God, people that are following after Jesus with their whole hearts, uh, and they start. Uh, was saying that, as you know, brothers, our visit was not a failure. Uh, he reminds them uh, that, th- that it's not a failure. How do we know that, is, that their visit uh, to Thessalonica was not a failure? Because Paul's writing to somebody right now. Paul's writing to the church that continued after they left. Uh, Paul's writing uh, to, to this church that he loves and he cares for. Uh, probably what happened here is that Paul's visit was was cut short. Uh, that Paul's visit, uh, they were there, some scholars believe, only there for a number of weeks. Uh, and his visit was cut short uh, because of, uh, because of un- unbelievers uh, rallying up. They were probably pagans, uh, worshiping some Greek gods more than likely. Uh, and they, they rose up and they drove uh, Paul and his companions out of the city. And Paul had no choice but to leave. And, uh, and then what was happening is that those pagans were telling the church, yeah, right, you follow Paul. He, he only stayed with you for a short period of time. Really? You're going to follow his message? Uh, you're going to trust what he says? Remember, he, he didn't even stick around with you. He left. And, uh, and so Paul's reminding them, look, brothers and sisters, this, this visit that we had, this time that we spent together, it wasn't a failure because your life is a testimony and there was great results in it. And, uh, and then in verse two, uh, we see, and this is, this is going to be the first uh, section that we're going to look at. This is going to be the motives of a disciple maker. Uh, this is verses two through six, this section, we see Paul's motives in, uh, in making disciples. Starts out by saying, uh, we previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, uh, but they still shared the gospel under great opposition or in the face of strong opposition. What happened in Philippi is as uh, Paul and uh, his companions were preaching the word, uh, there was a young girl who was uh, demon-possessed. And this demon-possessed girl uh, was following Paul and Silas and Timothy around and, uh, and probably causing some trouble. And uh, at one point, they drove the demon out of this uh, young lady this young lady uh, was owned by somebody else, and her job was to tell people's fortunes because of this demon possession. So now Paul has driven this, this person or this owner's way of making money out of this girl, and they were put in prison because of it. Uh, they, they messed with somebody's bottom line is what happened, and they were put in prison because of it. And if we read further on, we see where in prison, uh, the jailer actually becomes a follower of Jesus and so do his family. And, and then the chains come off Paul and, and his companions and, and Paul stays there. Uh, and, uh, and, and then eventually we see where Paul moves out of the city and then he comes to Thessalonica. So even in the face of great opposition, We see where Paul uh, is faithfully sharing uh, God's word. And then in verse 2, we see where it says that he is bold. It says that he, I I dare to tell you the gospel. He dared to be bold uh, even when he was under opposition. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if we would be so bold today that if somebody opposed us, that we would still uh, be bold and dare to tell the gospel in opposition. I think sometimes we, uh, we kind of cower away and we're quiet. I can remember a time, and the teenagers are familiar with this story, 
uh, when I was in high school. And uh, as I was in high school, I was sitting at this table with a couple girls and uh, I was probably a junior in high school. And I was uh, just hanging out, kind of just chilling. And this guy walked up, uh, this, this other young man who was my age. Uh, he went to a different church than me. Uh, and this kid was kind of known as the Jesus freak. And he walked up, he just said hi, uh, he, uh, he had his Bible in his hand, but he didn't really say anything about uh, God's Word or the Bible or uh, Jesus or anything like that. And then he, he walked away and he headed to track practice. And as he headed away, the two girls I was with started to make fun of him. They started to make fun of this uh, young man because of his love for Jesus. And he obviously, uh, he obviously lived out his convictions. And, uh, and guess what I did? I stayed quiet. I'd been a Christian since I was a young, young boy, and, uh, and I knew better. Uh, but in the face of opposition, I wasn't bold. Uh, in the face of opposition, I cowered away. And, and I'm still ashamed of that story today, even though I know that I'm forgiven uh, because of my sin of, of being a coward. And, uh, but uh, most of us, and I know for me, when I faced opposition, I cowered away. But we see where Paul and his companions were bold. They were bold to share the truth. And then in verses 3 through 4, it says, Our, the, the appeal that we made or that we make to you does not spring from error or unpure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God entrusted with the gospel. So we see verses three and four uh, that Paul was genuine in the way that he gave the gospel. So he was bold first and then he was genuine. It says that he was, that he was pure. He had pure motives. What was happening uh, a lot of times in uh, Thessalonica is these teachers would come through and they would teach philosophy uh, or teach religion or teach uh, something that yeah was important supposedly. Uh, and, and they would teach it for their own self gain. Uh, they would teach it uh, to either uh, elevate themselves socially or they would teach it to, uh, to, to make money. And, uh, and so their motives were unpure. They really weren't desirous to help people. Uh, they were desirous to help themselves. And, and Paul says, our motives were pure. Uh, we came to you with pure motives, not trying to, to trick you. What happens a lot of times with these philosophers is they spoke in words that many couldn't understand, only the very educated, and they would trick people into thinking that they were so smart that they should follow them. Paul says, I, I didn't desire to trick you. Uh, I, I just wanted you to know and understand the truth of God's word. It says... Uh, it says that, uh, that, that they spoke as men that were approved by God and entrusted with his gospel. They had pure motives. Uh, they were following God who knew and knows their heart. Uh, it's, it's so important that we understand this. Uh, they didn't, Paul and Silas didn't do this for themselves. Uh, they, they went to Thessalonica because God had called them to, and they were following God's will for their life. Uh, I can remember one time when I was in high school, uh, I got asked to be part of this uh, performance group. And the, the goal of this performance group was to share the gospel with people. They would go into big gyms and and, uh, and they would rally a group of people together. And then this was kind of a strongman competition uh, that they would do. And, and, and these were older guys and they, would, they used me as kind of a prop guy to hold different things, to hold different boards. And uh, the first time that I performed with this group uh, of men, I can remember standing behind stage and uh, they, they, they made it a, a real point not to ever uh, look out to see how many people were there. Uh, and uh, they, they instructed us to not do the same thing. Don't look out to so many people are there. Uh, whether there's one or 1,000, we're going to do the same thing. And uh, I can remember very vividly uh, in our time of prayer before this, uh, before this time of sharing the gospel and this, this kind of show that was going to happen, but then also uh, this time of sharing God's word, uh, that one of the men prayed. And at the end of his prayer, he said that they were performing for an audience of one. And that audience of one was Jesus. 
And that's really what we see here from Paul and Silas, that they, they went to Thessalonica because they loved others, but they really, they were, they were really pure and, and wanting, wanting God to be pleased with their life and not really caring if men were pleased. And I think that's so, that's so important for us to know today. Uh, it's easy for us to want to be approved by men and not by God. Uh, if we are choosing to honor God uh, with our lives and uh, doing the best we can to serve Him, uh, that's what's important, not if people like us or not. Uh, and then in verses 5 through 6, uh, we see that they didn't uh, go to the town for self-gain. Uh, he says, you know, we didn't use flattery, nor did we put on masks to cover our greed. God is our witness. We did not... Uh, we were not looking for the praise of men or from anyone else. So we see where they didn't do this to gain uh, for themselves. They didn't gain money. They weren't trying to get power. Uh, and they weren't trying to get the praise of men. Many of the teachers that would come uh, into Thessalonica were trying to get their own praise and power uh, and their financial gain. They really weren't about uh, honoring God. Uh, and, and Paul says, as God is my witness in everything that I do, please know that, that I've done this to honor God and to further his kingdom. So we see here that, uh, that Paul's motives were pure. Paul's motives were, uh, were only wanting to, uh, to honor Jesus. And, uh, and next, we're going to look at uh, his methods. Uh, as we walk through, Paul used uh, three different family examples uh, from, uh, from our text today. And we're going to look at those. And I think it's three methods that we can learn from. I want to caution us and I want us to be very careful uh, that, uh, that discipleship and, uh, and, and working uh, to further the kingdom and working for the Great Commission uh, is not just a three, a three method or three checkpoint uh, thing that we do. Uh, but sometimes uh, the process of discipling somebody uh, can, can be really hard. Uh, and we see where Paul, uh, Paul's life was, was very tough. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it means that we get into the messiness of people's lives. So as we, uh, as we think of discipleship, and as we think of uh, proclaiming the gospel to others, I want us to be very careful not to think that, uh, that discipleship or proclaiming the gospel is just us uh, walking out with a certain method that uh, that's like a trick that we go in and we hand somebody a track or we hand somebody a pamphlet uh, or we share this one uh, sentence that, uh, that convinces somebody to be a Christian. But this discipleship is this constantly walking life with somebody in order to share uh, the truth of Jesus so that their, the other person's life might look more and more like Jesus and they might be saved. Uh, so, but we have, we have three points. Uh, we have three different ways and methods that Paul used to further the gospel. Uh, ultimately, Paul's goal comes from Matthew 28. Paul wasn't part of this group of people, but Matthew 28 verses uh, 18 through 20. And this is the Great Commission. And Jesus tells his disciples, he says, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Surely I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Uh, sorry, I forgot a little section. Teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Sorry, the computer screen's very far away. Uh, surely I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Ultimately, that was Paul's goal. And ultimately, uh, that's what our goal should be, is to go into all the world and make disciples. Uh, does that mean that you have to go be a missionary to China or that you have to drop everything and move uh, to a foreign country? No, this means that amongst the people that we come in contact with, that we do everything we can to make disciples and to further his kingdom. The first method, let's look at it together, uh, comes from uh, verses 7 through 10. And, uh, and this first method is the mother method. And uh, we see, let's read verses 7 through 10 here. It says, But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her children. 
we loved you so much that we del- that that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become dear to us, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, the toil that we had not to be a burden to you. The toil that we had and hardships, we worked day and night not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel to you. You as our witness, and so is God of how holy and righteous and blameless our lives were. Uh, our, when, our, sorry, blameless we were among you who believe. So we see the first method is this mother method. And uh, Paul uh, had this great care for the people there. Uh, his, uh, he, he worked, it says that he, uh, he mothered them. Uh, and, and caring for the people. Uh, we loved you so much that not only did we tell you the words of God and share the gospel with you, but we shared your shared life with them. Uh, probably some of you mothers can, uh, can sympathize with this method, uh, but it's this method of caring day and night for somebody. We see where it looks like Paul, uh, it says, but we, but, but we shared our lives as well. To think about sharing our lives with somebody, uh, this is probably more than just like having lunch with somebody uh, or uh, or a quick high five uh, with somebody or just uh, giving a kind word to somebody. But we see this uh, thought of Paul uh, gathering them in, uh, caring for them, sharing life, uh, and, and really loving them. I can remember when our first son was born, Bryce, and... Uh, and Jasmine and I really had no clue what it looked like uh, to be parents, uh, but Jasmine picked up on it pretty quick. And uh, this mothering side, she uh, she spent day and night uh, feeding Bryce, caring for Bryce, uh, loving Bryce, making sure he his diapers were changed and he had plenty of food, and that uh, every need was taken care of. And it seemed like, at least for a short period of time, that uh, that the needs of Bryce consumed our, our life. And, uh, and we see this example from Paul where he's like, your needs were my needs. I did everything I could to love you and to care for you and to share life with you. And then we see that he uh, didn't desire uh, to, to be a hardship to him. Uh, he didn't desire to, uh, to, uh, to burden anybody. We see where it actually says that they, they worked uh, hard, they toiled, and uh, they, they didn't desire to have the people take care of them, uh, but they wanted to take care of themselves. And uh, that's very motherly. Uh, a mother doesn't depend on her children to take care of them, especially when they're children, uh, but the mother works t- hard, long hours to care for her kids and to love her kids and to make sure their kids have everything. So we see that Paul and caring and mothering and using this mother method, uh, he was able to share life with them. And then he was also able to share Christ with them. I want to encourage us that if, uh, that if there's people in your lives that need uh, to know the gospel, that maybe, uh, maybe you need to invite them f- closer into your life. Uh, maybe you uh, need to invite them uh, in and mother them a little bit and care for them a little bit uh, and have some of their burdens become your burdens uh, and, uh, and, and, and love them in that way. So the first method that we see from Paul uh, is this mother method where he worked hard uh, to share life with them and to care for them. The second uh, is the father method. And we see this in verses 10 through 13. And it says, uh, you are witnesses. And so is God, how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you. For you know that we delighted with each of you as fathers, or we dealt with each of you as fathers deal with their own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and in his glory. 
And, and it says, and we thank God constantly because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human words, but as actually the words of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So the next method we see that Paul uses is this fatherly method. I can remember when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, I did something wrong. I don't even remember what it was, uh, but I can remember my mom uh, very uh, gently and tenderly telling me to go to my room and to wait for my dad to get home. And uh, as she as she told me to go to my room and wait for my dad, I think I waited in my room for an hour or two and uh, my dad was at work. And as she told me as a mother to wait in my room, I could tell she was, she was upset and disappointed, but she was very calm and, uh, and very soft with me. And, uh, and, and like I said, I don't remember what I did wrong, but then I remember going to my room knowing that when my dad got home, I was gonna be in trouble. Uh, when my dad got home, uh, it wasn't going to be as nice as what my mom just did. And, uh, and, and I can remember my dad getting home. And uh, my dad, as soon as my dad walked into the door, uh, I can remember my heart starting to beat a little. Oh, I just hit my mic. Uh, beating a little hard. Uh, I can remember uh, thinking, oh man, I'm in trouble. And uh, it's because the father's job, at least in my house, uh, was to be a little stronger presence. And uh, my mom and dad went to their room and I could hear them a little bit and I could, uh, I knew that they were probably talking about what I did wrong. And then my dad came back to my room. And uh, when my dad came back to my room, uh, he strongly encouraged me uh, that whatever I did wrong was wrong. And uh, we see that uh, from Paul. Uh, we see where he strongly encourages them in verses 10 uh, through 13. And then uh, he comforts them deeply also. And then he urges them consistently. So we see this father's presence uh, where he encourages them uh, that, that they need to live a life that's worthy of Jesus they need to give their lives to, to God. This isn't the mother that's sharing life anymore. Now this is a strong encouragement. Uh, maybe even uh, telling them that uh, they need to give their lives to Jesus because of not uh, what the punishment looks like. Uh, and the punishment, obviously, for not uh, giving our lives to Jesus uh, is, is hell. And, uh, and I can see Paul strongly encouraging them. He also comforts them. But he comforts them, I think, in a little different way than a mother comforts their child. Uh, he comforts them, I think, by telling them the truth, uh, by telling them the truth of God and, and, uh, and, and telling them, look, things will be okay. Keep following Jesus. Things will be okay as you keep following God's will for your life. It might not always feel good. Uh, it might not always look pretty. Uh, but he comforts them knowing that God's in control. And then he urges them. Uh, and I could see this not as just, uh, hey, you should really keep living a life uh, that are, that's worthy of God. But he urges them and he constantly, continually uh, tells them to live a life worthy of God. I think that's so important for us. Are our lives worthy of God? You probably notice when I pray, Many, many times I ask God to help us to live a life that is worthy of the calling that he's placed on it. And my hope and prayer is that our lives are worthy of that calling. But as we think about making disciples, we, uh, we should be urging them uh, and encouraging them strongly like a father does to, to live a life worthy of the calling who calls us into the kingdom, or into his kingdom and his glory. Uh, it's so important. Uh, he doesn't call us just to go to church and uh, be nice to people, but he calls us into his kingdom and to his glory. So that's method number two. Method number two is that we, is the father method, and it's this stronger reinforcement and encouraging and comfort and urging to live a life worthy of the calling of Jesus. The third method we see from this passage 
that Paul uses is the brother and sister method. And we see where he uses uh, the terms brother uh, or brother and sister uh, a few different times, but we're going to look at it uh, closely in verses 14 through 16. Uh, let's read that together. It says, For you brothers became imitators of God's church in Judea, whom, uh, whom are in Jesus Christ, who suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who, who killed the Lord Jesus and whose prof, and the prophets who, and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to men in their efforts to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In the same way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. So we see where Paul, uh, and he also calls them brothers and sisters uh, in uh, verse 1, and then uh, I think also in verse 7, if I remember right. And uh, But we see where he appeals to them as brothers and sisters, and he appeals to their unity in Christ. And uh, as a disciple maker, uh, we can be encouraged uh, by others. Uh, by by what but by what's going on uh, in other people's lives and in uh, other churches' lives, we see here where it says you've become uh, imitators of the suffering uh, that happened in 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 Judea, and uh, the 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 suffering that the uh, Thessalonians are going through was very similar to what was happening uh, in in Judea. And they were driving out God's prophets, and ultimately, uh, the church in, uh, and the Jews in Judea were the ones, it says here, that, that killed Jesus and, uh, and then drove out the prophets. And we see where Paul is, is uniting them uh, together. Your sufferings are the same as other churches. Uh, the things that you're going through uh, are very similar to what's going on. And, uh, and Paul, he's like, as brothers and sisters, continue, continue together. Uh, as you, uh, church in Thessalonica, look to your brothers in, in Judea, know that their sufferings are similar to yours. Uh, know that uh, you can be uh, encouraged and strengthened uh, by what others are going through. Sacrifice of other believers should spur us on and unite us together. Uh, we see in uh, other places in Scripture where, where God's Word says that, uh, that, that we should be united together and we should be spurring each other on to love and do good works and, uh, and good deeds. It's kind of this bond of being on the same team. We should be bonded together as brothers and sisters uh, we should be uh, encouraged together as brothers and sisters, uh, not only by the sufferings, but maybe by the wins, maybe by the, the, the amazing testimonies of others uh, and what God's doing in other places. There's a bond that happens from being on the same team. I can remember uh, from back in my high school and college days of being on teams together and uh, the times of, of working hard together times of sacrificing together, the times of sweating and maybe bleeding together, uh, bonds us together, uh, it unites us together. And it's the same thing in the church. So Paul appeals to them. He says, look, brothers and sisters, be united together, be encouraged, this bond of closeness. And what's amazing is this bond of closeness happens because we're all bonded by the same blood and that's the blood of Jesus. Uh, we can know that he's covered uh, all of our sins if we've given our lives to him and we can be bonded together. Paul uses three different methods. He uses the mother method where he loves and cares and shares life, brings people into his home, doesn't desire to be a burden to somebody else, uh, doesn't desire his own gain, uh, but to share life with somebody he uses his mother method. He also uses this father method where he strongly encourages, strongly reinforces the truth of God's word and encourages the Thessalonians to live a life worthy of God. He also uses 
the brother and sister method where he calls them to be united, uh, to be united for the purpose uh, of furthering the kingdom, to remember uh, and know what each other are going through and to be united together by the blood of Jesus. I hope today as a church, uh, at least one of these methods uh, will resonate with you. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you think I do a really good job at caring for people and loving people, but I don't do a very good job at loving them and then sharing the gospel. Or maybe you're like, man, I'm really good at reinforcing uh, the truth of God's word, but I'm not all that great at loving others. Or maybe uh, you need to be encouraged by the unity that we have, uh, by, by the sufferings of others, uh, or by the, the winds of others. Uh, to keep moving forward for the gospel. My prayer today is that we would follow the example that Paul and his companions left us uh, and that we would go and make disciples, that we would be reminded of how important it is for us to share the truth of God's word with all those that we encounter. As tradition in our time, Together here recording, we're going to end in a hymn. Hopefully it's a hymn that will encourage us uh, to follow Paul's example. And it's, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's sing together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of Thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Him ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Ye blind, behold your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for leading us in that song. And uh, my prayer is that this week we would uh, walk in the truth and the power of God's word going into all the world and making disciples and following the example that Paul left. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, I can't wait for us to be back together as a church uh, meeting under one roof. And I want to remind you if that if there's any uh, needs or care that you need, uh, please contact the church office or contact Pastor Matt or myself. And uh, we want to be able to come alongside of you uh, and to love you as God's called us to. Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Lord, I pray that you would convict us. Lord, help us to walk uh, in a manner that's worthy of the calling you have on our lives. Lord, help us to, uh, to follow you in everything we do and to go and to make disciples. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.